I want to talk to us about a lesson about putting exceptions on our faith. And it's taken from, our lesson text is taken from John chapter 20, verses 24 to 29. Take your Bibles, if you will, and turn to John chapter 20. We're going to read what the Bible says about toward the end of the book of John. As John saw Jesus and the crucifixion, he writes about those things. And he tells us about what happened that day when our Lord died. And later on, his resurrection appearances to the disciples. And there's times when they saw Jesus would come there. There was one man by the name of Thomas who was not present at the times of those resurrection appearances of Jesus. But he finally would see the Lord. And in verse 24, the Bible says, But Thomas, one of the twelve, called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples were saying to him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see in his hands the imprint of the nails, and put my finger into the place of the nails, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. After eight days, the disciples were again inside, Thomas with them. Jesus came, the doors having been shut, and stood in their midst and said, Peace be with you. In verse 27, then he said, said to Thomas, Reach here with your finger and see my hands. Reach here with your hand and put it into my side. And do not be unbelieving, but believing. Thomas answered and said, to him, my Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who do not see and yet believed. We read these passages. We're reading about something that happened a long time ago. As we think about Thomas and what he did that day as he's asking to see Jesus. And not only to see Jesus, but also the imprints of the nails. Be able to put his hand into the side of Jesus. That's where we get our lesson for this morning about putting exceptions on our faith because sometimes we're like Thomas when it comes to that, and maybe in different matters. Maybe you'll say, well, I'll never get married until I find a woman that's really good and an awesome woman to marry. Maybe you've said like that something like I said like that. I'll never get married until that happens, until finally you meet that woman. Then you get married. Well, that can be the very case that many times we make exceptions on different reasons or different ways. Uh, it, it might say when it comes to different matters. What about when it comes to our faith? There are people like that today that will not believe unless something happens. I would say that there's a lot that happens in the religious world when it comes to that even today that some may say unless they see a sign or you might say a miracle, the signs and miracles, they go in hand in hand. They will not believe unless they see those signs and miracles. In Matthew chapter 12, take your Bible to Matthew chapter 12. I want to read about an occasion where this is also said by the Jews as well. Because Jesus, who was the very Son of God, and yet they did not believe Him when He came. They were looking for the Messiah, and when He came, they could not recognize Him. In verse 38... Here the Bible says, Then some of the scribes and Pharisees said to him, talking about Jesus, Teacher, we want to see a sign from you. But he answered and said to them, An evil and adulterous generation craves for a sign, and yet no sign will be given to it but the sign of Jonah the prophet. For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the sea monster, so will the Son of Man be three days and, and three nights in the heart of the earth. Down to verse, we read verse 40. I'll say the next two verses, but what are they asking Jesus here? What are they saying to Jesus? They want to see some kind of sign directly for them. And, you know, think about that. Jesus, at this point in his ministry, has done many signs and done many miracles up until this point. You may think, well, didn't they take those as signs and look at the miracles, things that Jesus had did and take them seriously? Well, they wanted some kind of thing personally for them. Verse 41 tells us, The men of Nineveh will stand up with this generation at the judgment and will condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonah. Behold, some, something greater than Jonah is here. 
Now, what is he saying there? He's saying the people of Nineveh only had to have Jonah say the words to them one time and, and preach to them, and they repented. Jesus, on multiple occasions, had preached to the word, the words of God to them, and had done to all the miracles, healed the lepers, and made the, the blind to see. He'd also cast out demons. And yet they say, oh, he does that by the power of Beelzebub. And yet they want a sign. That's why, because that's how Jonah, or actually the, the men of Nineveh will, will rise up because they had Jonah there to preach to them. But who is, who is Jonah compared to Jesus? And then verse 42, the queen of the south will rise up with this generation at the judgment will condemn it because she came from the ends of the earth to hear the words of Solomon. Behold, someone, something greater than Solomon is here. As the Messiah would be greater than Solomon. As wise as Solomon was, Jesus was the Son of God. One who was God manifested in the flesh. That's why he was greater than Solomon. And well, look what the Queen of the South, Queen of Sheba did. She went many miles to come listen to the wisdom of Solomon. And they had Jesus right there in their midst and would not listen to him, his wisdom, which is even greater than that of Solomon's. And so you see, that's sometimes how people, they look at signs. You know, I would believe in God if I was given a sign to believe in God. But would they really? Or would they be like the Pharisees, the, the leaders of the Jews? Once they get a sign, they, they still don't believe. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, 21 to 24, the Bible tells us here, and this is one of the reasons Paul is saying that when we are preaching the gospel, one of the great stumbling blocks to the faith of the Jews was they requested a sign. It says, For instance, in the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom did not know God. It pleased God through the foolish of the message preached to save those who believe. There's the power of the gospel, Romans 1, 16. Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God unto salvation. For Jews request a sign and Greeks seek after wisdom. In other words, they're looking for the wrong things. People who are looking for signs today are looking for the wrong things. Just like they were back then. Notice he says, but we preach. Here's the power of the gospel. is preaching about what? The Christ that's crucified and to the, the Jews a stumbling block, and to Greeks foolishness. For those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. And so you see how that, that was one of the major problems, or might say obstacles, of getting the Jews to get past the need for a sign, and even the Greeks to get past the, the seeking of wisdom in the message, because they would consider the message of the cross as foolishness, in a lot of ways. But I have the question this morning. Do people today wait on a sign? Are people today, are we sometimes guilty of doing that too? That, well, I'm looking for a sign about different matters in our lives, maybe choices and directions we go in life. Now, God has given us the wisdom. God has given us in his word the wisdom by which he can guide us and direct us according to his will for our lives, that's for sure. But say, so you want, if I'm looking for a job, so to speak, I say, well, Lord, just give me a sign which job. Maybe I have a choice between jobs. Just give me a, a sign which job to take. Is the Lord going to do that for me? Now, I know I've got to provide for my family, but I also know that God has given us the wisdom and the understanding. We pray about these things. But to have a vocal or some kind of dream or a sign about this is really more than really what God's going to give us in this matter. And some are even still looking for signs today when it comes to that. I read an article. I actually wanted to get that article and read it, but I thought, well, it maybe take too much time, so I decided against using it per se. But there was a woman on the Internet, which I looked at her and... Some of the reasons she gave for warning signs was because he did it in the past. God gave signs to Moses and to Gideon and to David. And so I'm waiting for a sign. It was also very interesting. Sometimes you look at the comments down below 
And some of the people was challenging her about this. You know, you shouldn't be, don't wait for a sign. Just do what the Lord says in His Word. And I said amen to that because, because sometimes God has acted in the past like this. In Exodus chapter 33, and even in chapter 3, He talks about how, what's the sign before Pharaoh? Well, you put your, your hand in your bosom, no words, and you pull it out and it's leprous. And you put it back in and it's, it's, it's healed. And He also said it will cast down your your staff becomes a snake. That's in Exodus chapter 3. But in th chapter 33, Moses is still wanting a sign. He's still wanting God to say, well, well, how am I supposed to know that I'm taking all the people to, to the promised land and everything that everything good you promised and you would give to us? He wants a sign even then about those things. What about all the wonders that God had done with the, with the ten plagues and everything he did, the, the parting of the Red Sea? God gave him a sign. He let him go into the cleft of the rock. And as he passed by, he said, I'll put my hand, lest you see all of me and die. And so God allowed Moses to see his glory in that way as he passed by. That was a sign that he was to be with him, would help him continually in everything he would do. In Judges chapter 6 was Gideon who was looking for a sign. In some ways, God got angry because he said, well, you already give him one side. And he said, well, you lay the fleece down and the whole place that was dew around it, yet the fleece was dry. Or the other way around. He did both ways. He said, well, you know, you have the fleece and it's dry and everything. And there's also the fleece is wet and there's no dew on the ground. So he did both of those signs with Gideon. In Psalm chapter 86, verse 17, even David said, Show me a sign for good that those who hate me may see it and be ashamed because you, O oh Lord, have helped me and comforted me. So there's times people want a sign. They'll try to justify signs in this way. Today, many still believe in signs of Mark chapter 16, verses 17 and 18. And we're very familiar with verses, uh, verses 15 and 16 about preaching the gospel to the whole world. He who believes and is baptized shall be saved. But here's what Jesus says after that verse. That these signs will accompany those who, who have believed. In my name they will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. They will pick up serpents. And if they drink any deadly poison, it will not hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. I don't know how many people have actually died from trying to handle snakes even today. But they're doing it in ignorance. We call them snake handlers. People who try to pick up snakes even today. They're challenging or testing what Mark 16, verse 17, 18 talk about. They say, well, these signs was followed the believers. Well, that was for a given period of time. During the time the written word was being confirmed. Notice it said, these signs will accompany those who believed. And all these things will do will, will confirm that the God is speaking through these people. Today, we don't need that today. That's why we don't have the miracles. Why we don't have to cast out demons today. It's because of that very fact. And yet people sometimes say, well, what about casting out demons today? Well, sometimes people are deluded when it comes to this. They think that demons still around in the sense embodying people like they did in the days of Jesus and the disciples. But I believe that the Bible teaches those age of miracles when it comes to that in men was a time of the construction of the church. Now we have the Word of God that leads us and directs us today. And some are waiting for the signs of Matthew 24. In Matthew 24, we see a lot of, of things that happen. Uh, you might say, well, some look for them to still happen today. About the abomination of desolation in verse 15, spoken to the prophet Daniel, standing in the holy place, and, and says, And those who are in Judea must flee to the mountains. They say, well, that's still future. No, that's talking about the destruction of Jerusalem. When God in 70 A.D. allowed the Romans to encompass Jerusalem and Jerusalem was destroyed. That's why he said, whoever's on the housetop must not go down to get the things that are in the housetop. Whoever's in the field must not turn back to get his cloak. And woe to those who are pregnant and those who are nursing babies in those days. And pray that your flight will not be in the winter. Now, what's this idea of a flight? Not taking an airplane to get somewhere. He's talking about that your, your 
your flight from the away from the city of Jerusalem by walking away from, and you're, you're fleeing for your lives, in other words. Because when the Romans would come, you'd have to get out of the city. That's what he's talking about there. They asked about the destruction. Jesus said at the beginning of Matthew 24 that not one stone will be left upon another. That's what the context of Matthew 24 is talking about there in that regard. And so that's why he said don't, you know, pray. You say pray that your flight be not in the winter because when the Lord comes, that final time when the Lord we expect the Lord to come, it doesn't matter if you're pregnant or not, whether your, your flight is in the winter or not because we're all going to be caught up in the air to meet Jesus. It will not matter. The situations of earth back then. But it did matter when Jerusalem was destroyed. Notice it even talks about here, some even talk about the moon turning to blood and all this great notable day of the Lord. These again are signs and symbols about things that are shaken. Hebrews chapter 12 actually talks about things that are shaken. And talking about the times when the the New Testament age would begin and all of that. And even with the church and everything, or destruction of Jerusalem, that final act that shows us that God is now with His people in the sense of the old days are left behind. So some are waiting for that. So if I see all these end time prophecies come together, then I'll believe in those things. Well, that's the exception sometimes people put on their faith. And again, there's times when people say, unless they have more evidence that there is a God, then they simply will not believe. Many an atheist and agnostic say they would believe if they could only see God or somehow test by a scientific method and show that God exists or, or some tangible proof beyond faith. Because, you know, faith is something not seen. Faith acts on things that we have not seen. And they say there is no real empirical evidence. In other words, that word empirical is simply a big word that means things you can test. You know, there are five senses. Your touch, your taste, your smell, things like that. Be able to know for a fact by empirical, empirical evidence for those things. Well, they say, first of all, there's no real proof of a creation. Back in the book of Genesis chapter 1 that God took a rib out of of, of Adam and made a woman and even made all the things. He did that on the sixth day. But even before that, he made all the moon, the stars. He formed this earth from nothingness, the void, and parted the seas at his word. And the evening and morning were the first day, the fifth day, all up until the time of the six days of creation. All of that happened because God said, let there be light and began from there. Even God himself they say, well, there's no evidence that God really exists. Or Jesus, the Jesus of the Bible. Or the Holy Spirit, as we talk about Him in the Scriptures. That He's a figment of, of imagination to those who believe in atheism. What about heaven? One of our great promises of God. That if we're faithful to Him, we can see heaven. And also, the punishment of hell is something they don't believe in. They don't believe in the devil and everything. They say, oh, that is superstition. They have to have more evidence in their minds than what is given to us than what we have. And to them, those who believe in atheism and agnosticism, when the Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7, for we walk by faith and not by sight, they just don't get that. It doesn't make sense to them to believe walking by faith because to them our faith is not really anything at all. They don't understand. God tests our faith by giving us, and there is evidence, but they reject the evidence. I would say they are more like Thomas who had to see Jesus before he believed. In John chapter 10, or John chapter 20, verse 29, I want to go back to that one more time. Where Jesus said to Thomas, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. He's talking about us, isn't he? We weren't there when Jesus was risen from the dead. 
We didn't, we're not able to, to put our hands in His side and see the imprints of the nails in His hands, but we do know people were there. Eyewitnesses of Jesus' resurrection. In a court of law, eyewitnesses mean a lot, don't they? People who saw something were there. Now, if people weren't there, they can't be eyewitnesses. We have many witnesses of the resurrected Savior. Paul would even say in 1 Corinthians 15, about over 300 people saw Jesus. And were still some were still alive there when he talked about that. And some say, unless they have more evidence, they will not believe when it comes to even the Scriptures. You know, the Scriptures are not enough evidence for them. They reject God's Word. They reject those eyewitnesses we talked about. But the eyewitnesses, the testimony of inspired men is not enough for them. You know, sometimes people reject out of hand before they really know the facts. There have been people, I guess one, one of the people who wrote the book about the case, the evidence of a verdict, something like that, that man set out to prove that what Jesus and all the Bible says was not true. But what he actually came to be, become a believer in Christ. Now he's a member of the denomination, of course, but you know the, the case, the evidence that demands a verdict is the name of the book that he wrote. Evidence that demands a verdict. John chapter 20, 30, 31. Jesus said, and truly, actually John says this, and truly Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples. We're not written in this book, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. The book of John was written to produce faith. It calls us, when we read the story about Jesus we're reading about a real person doing extraordinary, supernatural things, miraculous things that Jesus did. And that produces faith. People saw those things. Even Josephus, who was not a member of the church, could say Jesus was, a, was there and was a real person. In Luke 16, verses 27 and 31, going back to the rich man Lazarus that we bring up from time to time, remember the... The two conditions, Lazarus went to the, the bosom of Abraham and the rich man went to torment. And he said to, to Abraham, then he said to him, I beg you therefore, Father, that you would send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers that he may testify to them, lest they also come to this place of torment. Abraham said to him, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. I'm going to stop there for a moment. What's he saying here? We're all given the evidence of the scriptures. We're not to ask for something super. Your faith does not, res not resound in having to see a miracle or having more evidence than the scriptures for you to have faith in the Savior, in our Lord. And so here he's saying, you know, even if one rises from the dead, that's what he said here. He said, that, no, no, Father Abraham, but if one goes to them from the dead, they will repent. But he said to him, if they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they first be persuaded, though one rise from the dead. And that's actually talking about Jesus, isn't it? Jesus came from the dead. Actually could refer to Lazarus in some ways. Because even Lazarus was risen from the dead. And they still wanted to put Lazarus to death. They didn't believe in Jesus, even though Jesus had the power to resurrect someone. And yet that's not, that's not where our faith stands. Our faith stands in the truth about who Jesus is and what He did for you and I at Calvary when He died on the cross. They also reject the evidence of design that demands a designer. You know, that's a scientific fact. That when you see something, when somebody wants to lose a watch and it lays on the ground, you know, so oh, that, that watch there just happened to be there over millions and billions and billions and trillions of years. Now we know that doesn't work that way. When a watch is found on the ground, somebody made that watch. It just doesn't happen that way, does it? Same thing about you and I 
and everything we see around us, the design of this universe. In Psalm 19, verses 1 through 6, the Bible teaches us back then that the heavens declare the glory of God. That's what he says. The heavens are telling the glory of God and their expanse is declaring the works of His hands. Basically he's saying, you can look around and see everything that God has done. His fingerprints are everywhere on this earth. And David even saying in Psalm 139, verse 13 and 14, says, For you form me in my, my inward parts. You cover me in my mother's womb. I will praise you. For I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works. And that my soul knows very well. What's David's point? David's point. Even though he was in his mother's belly. God is the one who did that. People sometimes talk about the miracle of childbirth. Well to God it's nothing to do what we really refer to as the miracle of childbirth. It's simply what God has done for all of us. Being able to say, well, be fruitful and multiply upon the earth. And David knew that very well. Your body is one of the greatest testaments that there is a God. Your eyes, as marvelous as they are, are an invention that men have studied for years and years and still haven't found out everything about your, the marvels of the human eye. And your hands made perfectly with opposable thumbs. Two legs, two hands, two feet, and the toes. Why did God put all those? Now those things are not accidents. Everything worked. The fact that we, our lungs can breathe in carbon dioxide and expel that, the oxygen, and, and get rid of all the bad parts of that. We breathe in and breathe out. That's no accident, is it? God made us. And some will say, Unless the majority believes it, they will not believe it. Now sometimes people put their finger to the wind and say, you know, which way the wind's blowing? That's the way I want to go because I want to not be out of the in crowd. Now, some base most, the most important decisions of life on what others believe. And that's sad, but that's the way the world many times. We don't want to be out of step what other people are doing. But I believe this becomes an unspoken form of peer pressure to conform to the world's beliefs. Romans 12 verse 2 tells us to be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of our minds by the Word of God. But you know, the majority has never been for God's ways 100%. In Matthew chapter 7, 13 and 14, that's why Jesus would say, Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go in by it because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life. And there are few who find it. And Luke 13 echoes the same. For time's sake, I'm going to go on to the next point. The point is, would Noah have been saved by listening to the majority? In Noah's day, what was the majority doing? They weren't getting into the ark. They weren't listening to God, even though God was speaking through Noah trying to get people to go into the ark. 1 Peter 3 verse 20 tells us about those people who were formerly disobedient when once the divine long-suffering waited in the days of Noah while the ark was preparing in which a few, that is eight souls, were saved through water. Only eight people got into the ark and were saved. The only majority we should want, strive to be is those of faith. We talked about this morning about those people of faith in Hebrews chapter 11. In chapter 12, verse 1, he talks about those who are of that crowd, that great crowd. They're surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses, if you will. Let's lay aside every weight and the sin that so easily ensnares us. But you know, that, they weren't the majority then, were they? There are people hundreds of years in the making of that. And we should have our own mind and choose faith over fear about what others might think. There was once a school board that wanted to teach creation. And they did for a while. They put away, you might say, the theory of evolution out of what they were doing. But they quickly realized by pressure they were going to stand out. And they didn't want to be the laughing stock of the whole world, the whole scientific community. 
So they stopped teaching creation. How sad that is. But sometimes people want to go with what the majority want people to believe and think. And I want to talk about this last point in the lesson is yours. Unless it is a convenient season, I will not believe. That's what sometimes people say. It's taken from Acts 24, verse 24 to 27. That after some days when Felix came with his wife Drusilla, who was Jewish, she sent for Paul and heard him concerning the faith in Christ. Now as he reasoned about righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come, Felix was afraid and answered, Go away for now. When I have a convenient time, I will call for you. Meanwhile, he hoped that money would be given to him by Paul, that he might release him. Therefore, he sent for him more often and conversed with him. I want you to think about this. These other conversations were not like the first conversation, were they? Because Felix lost his conviction. It says, but after two years, Portius Festus succeeded Felix, and Felix wanted to do the, the Jews a, a favor, left Paul bound. Now, if he had been convinced by Paul, he would not have leave Paul bound. He would say, I'll help you, brother, if he had believed in Christ. But he never found that convenient season. There is no convenient season. That's really a myth that the devil uses to keep us right where he wants us. By saying, you'll do it later. There'll be a convenient season later on. Right now, you're too busy. You've got other things going, and it, it, it costs too much of your time away from what you really want to do. Or it might be even the sin that you want to hang on to. Felix may have thought there'd be an easier time to stop sinning later on. Felix was not a righteous man. Like all of us, we've all known about sin. But the difference between Paul and Felix was Paul was willing to give up his sin and live for Jesus. Felix did not. The Bible teaches us that many times, many places, that sin is not easy to give up. But the Bible says we must give it up. Luke 13, 3, Jesus said, I tell you no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Just like those 18 which the Tower of Siloam fell on. They weren't sinners, Jesus said. Not worse sinners than anybody else. But unless we all repent, we're all going to perish. We have to turn away from sin. That's just a fact of, of the gospel, isn't it? Acts 17, verse 30 and 31. Our last scripture says this. Truly, these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent because He has appointed a day in which He will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom He has ordained. He has given assurance to this or of this to all by raising Him from the dead. There's people there who mocked that day. Just like people say, I, I don't believe the evidence. Unless I see it, I, I don't believe it. We have to believe in faith. Starts out by faith. We want to be saved. Starts out by faith. Repentance of your sins. Confession of Christ to be the Son of God. And baptism into water for the remission of your sins. We can help you do that this morning. Let us help you. Because we're willing to help you. We want to help you. Get rid of the devil as your master so you can serve Jesus Christ. Your subject to invitation call. Why don't you come as together we stand and we sing the song that's been selected.